Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Building a Company with Heart, a conversation with Maxine, with Maxine Clark. Um, my name is Bryson Ferguson. I'm a student from Mizzou, and I will be your host for today's event. As you all know, I am joined with a very special guest, Maxine Clark. I'm going to give you a little bit of background information just so that you can get a sense of who it is that you will be listening to tonight. Maxine Clark is one of the true in innovators in retail industry. Her pursuits and contributions have led to successes in retail marketing, including Build-A-Bear Workshop, which she founded in 1997. Today, there are more than 400 Build-A-Bear Workshop stores worldwide, and nearly 200 million stuffed animals have been sold. In June 2013, she stepped down from her CEO role in the company to focus more time on the Clark Fox Family Foundation and its mission to support the growth and prosperity of the St. Louis metropolitan region through research, program development, and investments in education, public health, immigration, social injustice, and other areas. Her work has been and continues to be recognized. Maxine is the recipient recipient of many accolades, including being inducted into the Missouri Public Affairs Hall of Fame in 2017 and receiving the State Missourian Award for Outstanding Public Service in 2019. Currently, she serves on the board of Build-A-Bear, Foot Locker, and the National Public Broadcast Service, among others. So everybody, let me introduce Maxine Clark. Hi there, great to meet everyone today. So I wanted to start off this conversation by, um, by going back to a time where we can relate as students. So I wanted to know, like, when you were a college student, what did you want to do and how were you pursuing that and what were your ambitions? That's a great question. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, although it wasn't quite yesterday. I went to the University of Georgia, a large state university, where I got a fantastic education, but it was an interesting time. It was similar to the times we're in now, but it was the beginning of the, the civil rights movement, and I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. I wanted to change the world. I think like a lot of college students do, you just don't know exactly how you're going to do it, but at least in this case, I knew that lawyers were important, they were involved in politics, and I wanted to do anything that a that I thought a woman didn't do in, in that particular point in time. And I knew that lawyer, women lawyers weren't too common. So that was my strategy. Uh, but I was a student of journalism. I major, majored in journalism and I was a good writer and I was a good marketer. And so those things all played into my interest in business, although I wasn't thinking about a career in business, but in order to go to law school, I had to pay for it. And so I went to law school in Washington, DC, and I worked for the heck company in Washington, DC. And, uh, I had a great send off there that really got me connected to the, the consumer and to what consumers want because I was the consumer. I was working woman in 1971, knowing all the things I needed that the marketplace didn't offer. And I was looking to create it and bring it to the marketplace. So um, it all kind of collided. Uh, a professor that I had in college, um, Dr. Carter, uh, Robert Carter was his name. He told me that you know, when you look for a job, you should go into retailing. You're really good at this stuff. I was a good shopper. I knew that. I knew how to spend the money, even though I didn't have much. But I never thought about all those connections of consumerism and what consumers wanted in psychology and marketing and business and law. And quite frankly, today, they've all collided in my life in a good way. Yes, and it seems that decision uh, paid off as you worked in a Payless shoe store and you climbed your way to the top. Um, but in 1996, as the president of Payless shoe store, uh, you decided to leave your career behind and look towards starting a company. So I wanted to know, like with these big ambitions and you're living a comfortable lifestyle, um, working for Payless, um, what were your biggest fears and nerves and how did you confront that when trying to make a new decision? Well, you know, it's a, uh interesting how life has a way of the journey is far better than the destination. I tell that to every student I talk to because along the way you find out a lot of things that you, and my strength is I didn't, I know what I don't know. And I have this enormous curiosity about what that is. And in 1996, I was the president of Payless Shoe Source. It was a large, the largest division of the May company, which is where I went to work when I was working to go to law school and had to take a leave of absence to do my job, at, which I'm still on that leave of absence uh, today. Um, so, you, you know, life doesn't always go exactly the way you planned. It turns out better. 
Um, you know, just have to follow your instincts. But I really, the internet was coming on very, very strong. And I knew that it could change the way the consumer interacted with their stores, with workers, with companies. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I knew that I was going to start a company. I didn't know what it was going to be yet, but I knew it was going to engage with technology. And it was also going to engage with children. Because when I was a little girl, I loved to go on field trips for school. And I learned so much that I even can remember exactly those field trips today. And I think children, experiential learning is important. And so coming to Build-A-Bear is an experience. And I wanted to create something that would um, really relate to their lives and the lives of their parents and their grandparents and teenagers. Uh, little did I know how much of a connection it would make um, for young people of all ages. And that means three to 103. Um, but it really worked. It was great timing um, because we were hitting that high tech time period. And we created a product that was high touch totally in conflict. And you actually had to come to the store to participate. You couldn't just do it online, even though you could have bought it online. But um, we really were at the right time in the right place. And I have a good sense of that timing. Having been so consumer oriented for the prior 25 years, I knew uh, what consumers wanted, what they were looking for. I was always talking to them. And in this case, um, my consumers were children and what better marketplace to talk to and get ideas from than little kids. It was fantastic. Well, wow, thank you. Um, I had a question about, you had this job at Payless, you're in the corporate environment, and then you went to a startup environment. Um, what were some of the difficulties and challenges that you faced during that transition? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question, because actually I had so much, um, I'd been in the business for such a long time, I had many, many connections. And so if I needed to know about distribution or allocation or uh, logistics, I just called up the friend from the May company and they would say, oh, here's who I recommend to you. Or, but I also had met a lot of those people along the way. And that's one thing that I think is really important, the power of the network that you create along your journey. Not just the, the first it starts with your teachers and um, from you know, elementary school all the way through college. I am still in touch with my professors from, from high school and college, actually. Uh, and that was a long time ago. So teachers have, a, have the ability to live a long time in your life. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I know there's a lot of them on this call. It's because it's really true. They're your first mentors um, when you start out in this world um, next to your parents. And if you listen closely, um, the good advice and some of the things that you think aren't the best advice they're all parts of the learning process that take you there. But I didn't, I didn't miss the people that I worked with because I was still in touch with them. And I knew I could connect with them. And actually, everybody was telling me, you know, stay in touch. Like, maybe I can come and work for you someday or, you know, how that was working. But it was the right time to be starting a business and especially one uh, in the retail business. The economy was booming and uh, we were off to a really good, we got off to a really good start because it was something that kids of all ages, remember three to 103 could relate to. We all had at least one stuffed animal when we were little kids and grandparents wanted their, their grandchildren to have this wonderful experience. And it was right in the mall so they could get there. It wasn't like you had to go to Disney World to experience it. You could experience it in your local mall. Eventually, as we built our company, almost every major mall in the country has a Build-A-Bear. Uh, you talked about how just now, how Build-A-Bear is in a mall. I wanted to know, kind of your thinking um, during that startup process of when you're trying to choose a location, um, how you were approaching getting funding, um, and like how you were choosing to expand your team as well and hiring and all of those things that come with starting a business. Yeah, that's, that was a wonderful, it's a wonderful American dream story. I don't say that this dream comes to everyone this easily, but remember I had worked in the business for 25 years. I was at actually 48 years old when I started Build-A-Bear, not 28 years old or 22 years old, like a lot of entrepreneurs are. So I had built up a lot of relationships and I had built up a successful reputation. I don't think that you have to, that's not a required ingredient, but for me, it was very helpful. And, um, I had talked to a lot of venture capital people about starting Build-A-Bear and how they might fund it. I was willing to put my own money into it. I made a good living and I had saved a lot of money. Um, and I had a lot of make company stock that I was able to convert into cash that could help me start Build-A-Bear. But people were advising me against that. They said, oh no, you don't, don't use your own money, you know, leverage other people's money. So I went looking for that, but I didn't find anybody that really got what I was talking about, which is really creating this meaningful experience, a memory uh, of something that families would take with them for the rest of their lives. And um, so I decided to just do it myself. You know, I had the money, why not do it? I worry about the rest of the money later. 
But luckily for me, in July of the year that we opened up, I got a phone call. An article was in the St. Louis Business Journal about Build-A-Bear. And about 11 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from a local entrepreneur who wanted to meet me. He said he'd, he'd heard of me, he didn't know me, but when I come to his office on Monday and talk to him about the business. And I got there and we talked about it and he said, how much money do you think you need uh, in the next few years? And I said, well, you know, four or five million. And he said to me, is next Thursday soon enough? So that's a pretty good story. I didn't get it next Thursday, but pretty closely thereafter, we didn't actually take all the money, but we had it on a, on a payout basis as needed on a, um, milestones based on hitting certain milestones. But believe me, not having to um, worry about the money from the beginning was a good thing. And he, he asked me, he said, how much do you think I should own for my four and a half million dollars? And I knew not to compete against myself. So I said, well, how much do you think you should own? And he said, well, I'd be happy with 20%. So you can figure out the math. I ended up having a valuation from the, before the store even opened um, of a very high, high valuation for a retail company with no revenue yet. Um, and that served me well because we had several things that we needed to expand. Our business was so successful from the very first day we opened that we could see that we were going to grow fast. And we opened our next few stores the next year. And you need money for that. But actually, my largest investors became our landlords um, because the malls, the de- malls, people that develop malls are, you know, very successful people. And they try to bring the best stores to their mall. So my second store was in Kansas City. Uh, at Oak Park Mall, and they wanted us to come. So they gave us a great location and some cash to help us build out our business. And then our third and fourth stores were in Chicago. And um, one of them gave us some, a little bit of help and the other one didn't because it was Woodfield Mall and they don't do that, you know, that kind of thing. But eventually we, we ended up getting about our entire store built out by the help of our landlords. And they became our largest investors, although they owned no equity. Um, they just gave us cash. It's called tenant allowance towards building out the store. And we were on the way, you know, it was, a, it was something that every mall owner wanted to have. Uh, I knew where all the malls were. I mean, Payless Shoe Source had stores in most of the B and C malls in the, in the country, not the A, you know, the high end malls, but I knew where every shopping center was. Again, remember I'm a consumer. Uh, and when I traveled on vacation, my idea of a good vacation was a place where I could go and see what the consumer was doing, which was usually the mall. Now that's changed dramatically now. After COVID, we're going through a big, you know, uh, rethinking about mall-based retailing and, and direct-to-consumer retailing. And so we maybe we'll talk about that, but that's not as easy as it was when I started Build-A-Bear 23 years ago, almost 24, almost 24 years ago. Yes. One thing I've noticed just from the short time that you've been talking is that you always seem to be a going against the grain and always trying to do something um, new. I wanted to know, like, where do you find this courage from or where do you kind of have the courage to take these risks? Hmm. I've always been uh, gutsy. You know, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Grace, uh, she used to grade our papers with those red pencils that you, you know, your teacher grades your paper with. I usually have one handy, but I don't think I have one right in front of me right now. And um, she used to give it away every Friday, not to the student that were the best attendance or the smartest or the best behaved, but to the student that made the most mistakes that week. So I was six years old and I'm learning to make mistakes. I'm raising my hand because I think I know the answer, but I, sometimes I didn't. I had the most red pencils in my little you know, box, my cigar box in my desk, because I was always willing to at, think I knew it or ask a question. And I think that's my curiosity has always played well for me. So I'm always learning. And w- when you're ahead of the curve, because you're learning ahead of the curve, it's not as big a risk to you as it might seem to somebody else. Um, Because I'm very curious about things. I want to know about whether it's science or math or business or, you know, anything. I'm just an avid reader. And whether it's a magazine or a newspaper or a new book that just came out today, I'm buying it and I'm I'm starting to dig into it to see how does that impact me. Um, That isn't great for all the people I ask questions of because sometimes, you know, I have three or four questions to ask in a a session. But um, I say always ask questions. No one expects you to know it all. And in that questioning, you're going to learn something that you didn't know. And that's going to give you more confidence to go to the next step and the next step. That's what learning is all about. And it's lifelong. It doesn't stop when you graduate from college. It shouldn't stop when you graduate from college. Let me put it that way. Um, It should keep going. And you just, and then you become a teacher too. So you're giving and taking. That's what mentors do. They teach and they, they get, give, get back more information and then they can give it back to more people that they mentor. So it's a give and take process all the time. And that keeps me uh, energized too about what the new trends are. And um, right now I support 15 
African-American entrepreneurs across the country, and they are rocking it. They are doing so well because they know exactly what their customer wants, and they're giving it to them. And I'm getting to be part of those businesses in a way that I could never have imagined. And I don't have to do the work. I get to you know, just opine and give them advice. And then they call me and say, guess what we did yesterday? Guess how many downloads we had? Or guess how many orders we had? This is the joy of, of being um, an entrepreneur. And I get to experience it even as a retired entrepreneur. And as a mentor, and you talked about in the past being a mentee and having mentors, what advice do you have for students that are looking for a mentor and how do we connect with one? And um, what are some of the characteristics that we should be looking for to? Well, I would say go to as many events that interest you as possible. Um, it's easier to do right now on Zoom. It's not personal in the sense that you can't really shake someone's hand and give them your business card and you know, look them in the eye so they don't get to see. But, the, but it is a way to, to learn a lot and to meet a lot of people. And I'd say that if somebody interested you, if you were on this call today and you were listening to me talk and you had a question, you, know, you should seek me out you know, and say, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I have another question. Would you mind answering it? Um, or could we have a 15 minute call uh, to uh, talk? And most of the time people will say yes but it's up to you to invite them. And that doesn't mean they're going to be your mentor, but that's just the first introduction. And then, you know, it, it keeps up. It, take, it takes, it's a lot of effort on both people's parts, but if it's the right mentor and the right mentee, it's, it's fun. It's not work. It's joyful to see how um, each other develops in the relationship. And I think that's what most mentors that I know feel, but it's not like you can just go and say, will you be my mentor? And then it automatically happens. Although that's been done before and people do it. And sometimes that works. It really is, you know, using your network and making sure there's somebody that you think you really would want as a mentor, that you think will be honest with you, that you will be able to take their honest um, feedback and deal with it in the most appropriate way. That's also always sometimes a challenge. Um, but generally speaking, people want to help. They want you to be successful. They're excited about your success and they just want to be a part of it. So how can they play a part? Some people have more time than others. Some things don't take very much time. I have a friend, Adam Grant, who's a professor at the um, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School, and um, he calls it the five minute favor. I, I say it's 10 minutes because I'm a little more talkative than he is, but it doesn't take long to connect someone. If you can't answer their question, what does it take to connect them to somebody in your network that would be able to help them? And that's really also something that I do all the time because I don't have the answers to everything. Um, but I do know a lot of people in my course of my lifetime that have helped me and I'll never recommend anyone to anyone that I don't trust myself. So it's, if I'm re re recommending a, a, a 3PL, a logistics company, it's somebody that I know uh, did, never let me down and they probably won't let you down either because that's important. Um, that's one of the things that coming to the table is really important these days because um, you, know, you need a lot of suppliers to help you make a product, distribute the product, help you about social media. And you wanna use people that will recognize you're a young entrepreneur or an entrepreneur of any age and that you're willing, to, you, you wanna uh, work with them, but you also maybe don't have a lot of resources, cash resources. Uh, you don't have um, a lot of product yet, but you're going to. And how can they be a partner in that process, helping you get to where you need to go? Not a partner like necessarily an owner, although that could work out too, but a partner in the development of the business. I found it really interesting how um, you said that whenever you recommend people, um, it's somebody that you trust and somebody that kind of serves to build your reputation. You have to be able to trust them because they affect your reputation. Um, switching gears just a little bit, um, Build-A-Bear has always been a company that has um, benefited society. Um, and even in 2004, Build-A-Bear started a foundation I wanted to hear your perspective on companies that are for profit and uh, make profit, but still how they promote social good. Mm -hmm. Well, when I started Build-A-Bear, um, a founder can bring their own personal values to the business. We all should bring our values to work every day. And you should go to work for a company if you're going to work out of college for a company or any time in your lifetime that believes in your values. And you can know that today um, because companies you know, or online and you can see it into a company. You can also go on to um, glass ceiling or glass door and find out what people think about the company. Uh, it doesn't mean that somebody is being negative is necessarily everybody's opinion or if somebody's being positive, it's everybody's opinion, but you can get a feeling. You can also go there and see it, you know, which is really an interesting opportunity. But um, 
I would say that that is, that you want to work for some place where it's your values. I brought my values to Build-A-Bear. When I wrote my business plan, I wrote about the values, how I wanted to treat my employees, how I wanted to treat the customers, how I wanted to treat the world, what I wanted to do with our success, one teddy bear hug at a time. What would a teddy bear do? I mean, I know that sounds a little silly, talking to college students that are going to go out and change the world, but really, if you look at the eyes through the eyes of, and the hug of a teddy bear, you're going to do the right thing no matter what, if you always use that goal. And so we did. And we all also believed in the power of yes. Um, yes to our customers. No one customer could ever put us out of business, nor would they, and nor would 10 customers have put us out of business. What put, would put us out of business is not responding to the customer's wants and needs and uh, treating them with respect um, because it's their money. And I remember working in our Build-A-Bear store, the first store of the Galleria, a lot of days. And kids would come in, they were so excited to come to Build-A-Bear, they had a little Ziploc bag with all their pennies and dimes and quarters that they had saved up to come to Build-A-Bear. That is like unbelievable. They're giving you this money that they saved to make a bear and they're so excited they can barely stand it. They don't know who I am from Adam, I'm just working behind the cash register. But I could tell the sparkle in their eye and that kept me going and that was what we cared about. And of course we wanted to give back to our customers. Our customers were families and children. And so we, our foundation that we created, um, my husband and I put money into the foundation when Build-A-Bear went public in 2004 into the company foundation, but we also founded our own personal foundation to give back to St. Louis, particularly families and families that um, maybe didn't have all the benefits that, um, that come to middle-class families. Uh, the, the, I wanted to make sure that every child in St. Louis had a teddy bear. And not necessarily was I gonna give them one, but I wanted to make it available to them some way, shape or form. Although we did give away a lot of bears. But now when I go and meet children in classrooms, regardless of where the school is, north, south, east, or west, kids bring me their teddy bear that they made at Build-A-Bear. They tell me their name. They tell me their story. This is exactly what I wanted. And it's a benefit I didn't really anticipate because now at 20, nearly 24 years old, we've inspired a generation of makers. And maybe all of you are thinking about being social entrepreneurs or, or for-profit entrepreneurs because you made a bear at Build-A-Bear and you knew you could. Who told, you know, who told you that? You just found out you could. And you could dress a, a frog in a ballerina dress or a, a pink bear in a baseball outfit. It's up to you. Your imagination took over. And we have seen some absolutely incredible stuffed animals made in our store with lots of love, with many good wishes inside. And what better thing to do than to turn that money around and put it back into the community of St. Louis and around the country. The Build-A-Bear Foundation supports all around the country but our foundation mostly supports St. Louis and Missouri in, in particular. Yes, that is so inspiring. I remember going to Build-A-Bear uh, when I was young and I had to pay with my Christmas money, um, but that Build-A-Bear was uh, one of my favorite stuffed animals. I don't have him with me today, but he's, at, he's back at home right on my bed, uh, or, or right on my nightstand. His name was Super Pup. He had all of the clothes um, that he needed. But one thing I really found interesting was how you talked about some of the work you're currently doing um, in the St. Louis community. And I wanted to, uh, I hope everybody can see your beautiful background, Delmar Divine. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on that and some of the other um, social good things that you're doing. Yeah, currently. oh, there are a lot of things, but they all connect. When you turn over the rock of education, public education in particular, there are a million spiders underneath there and some are there, some of their webs are knotted or torn and you have to figure out a way to put them together. They are not unrelated. And I was thinking about that today with the passage of the American Rescue Act, how many things are involving children and families for once. I'm not sure what took us so long to realize this because children are our future and it does take a lot. And there's many children that aren't, don't have an opportunity um, to, to go to a school that's the best school in the, in the land because they live in a neighborhood where that school might only have minimal resources. It shouldn't be that way, but that is the way it is. And you can't change it without um, really being intentional about it. And so this particular project, um, I actually came upon this property when I was working, to, we were creating a charter school in St. Louis, in the city of St. Louis called KIPP. And it was right in this neighborhood. And I was making a right, I decided to go a different way home. And I turned right instead of left. And I came by this building that was being put, they were nail, literally nailing the for sale sign. And I looked at it and I said, what is this place? I'd never gone that way before. And I saw that it was a hospital. It actually um, was, it had been turned into a, a medical facility, but it was no longer really a hospital. 
And uh, I thought, what if they tear it down? What are they get, what's going to happen to it? You know, what will happen to this neighborhood that we just put a school here and the school is thriving? And um, I called up a few people, tried to get some people to help me. They said, we're too busy. Why don't you do it? So I said, yeah, why don't I do it? I know exactly what I wanted it to be. If you've been to St. Louis, you may have seen Cortex, which is a, a, a kind of a social enterprise around entrepreneurship, particularly tech and science, bioscience. Right, it's closer to St. Louis University than it is to Washington University. We're really close to Washington University. But I thought, why don't we do this for nonprofits? Nonprofits, there's thousands and thousands of them in St. Louis and many, many, many thousands more in Missouri. But how could we bring them together in a, in a place and a space that would inspire collaboration? So this particular building was almost 500,000 square feet. It's, that's half a mall. You know, and most people, if you can think about the size, it was a hospital. The first building was built in 1904. Um, the last building was built in 1965. So it's all classified as historic by today's standards. And I bought the building and I figured out what to do with it. I, I went and got a lot of advisors to help me. I had no idea. I think sometimes it's good not to know because if you don't know all the things that could happen in the process, you would probably, you know, you, you won't turn it down. But had I known, I might have not done it because it's very complicated and very expensive project. But if not me, who? That's how I kind of look at a lot of these challenges that get thrown in front of me. And maybe I can set an example for others. So this building, we bought it about five years ago and it will open in this fall, um, fall of 2021, as uh, offices for about 35 nonprofits. And the big building that you can see behind me, which was the, the new hospital built in 1961, that's gonna be apartments. Uh, affordable apartments for teachers, nurses, social workers, public health, public safety, young, diverse professionals that want to live in a cool place. This is on Hollywood and Vine in St. Louis, Del Mar Boulevard, which is a dividing line in St. Louis also between black and white and rich and poor. But it's halfway between Washington University undergraduate campus and the medical school campus, halfway between this, the Loop and the Central West End on a major bus line, two metro stops, Forest Park, what, what could be better than this? You can walk it's in New York or Chicago or some major city. This property would be worth zillions of dollars. In fact, in our neighborhood, in our zip code, 63112, houses range in price from 4000 to two million, almost $2 million. That's how, how wacky St. Louis is sometimes. But we're excited to be here. We, we're, not only are we going to have the nonprofits and the apartments, but we're also going to have retail on the main floor, a bank, um, the first Black-owned pharmacy in St. Louis in 50 years. We're gonna have a, maybe an Edward Jones um, personal finance office there because there's lots of people that need that um, uh, starting to invest and starting to invest in their future. And then we'll also in the second phase, we have a, that was the nursing school. We think we can convert it into maybe a really state-of-the-art early childhood center, you know, from zero to maybe eight years old in one, in one great building. Um, so we have a lot to do. Um, it's not easy but we're bringing a lot of people together to help, help me in this project. It's about a hundred million dollar project. Um, not all cash, you know, you borrow it from the bank. We got a loan, a HUD loan for the apartments. Uh, we have a uh, new market tax credits, historic tax credits, and then we raise private donations as well. And that was hard because a lot of people thought, why this neighborhood? You know, it's, it's Del Mar. Why are you investing your money in Del Mar? But um, it's going to change people's minds about Del Mar, and it will no longer be called the Del Mar Divide. It will indeed become divine, and we will not be the only people working towards it. Lots of other people since we started are investing in this neighborhood as well. So it's going to be uh, transformational. So it's a, a place to, to work and be creative and improve our community, but also transform a neighborhood. It's a hug. It's a giant hug, like a teddy bear hug. <laughs> Wow, that's really inspiring. I know you have um, a personal philosophy when it comes to social good um, and helping uh, people and allowing people to help themselves. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on that philosophy and share yeah. with us. Uh, I have a lot of philosophies about this, but I believe in helping people build their assets. Like one plus one should equal 100. I was, you know, this is a new math. That's the new math of the 21st century. We cannot do the same things and expect them to equal you know, some kind of old normal. It's just not good enough. And we have to make up for lost time. So how can we help people? So, you know, we're going to have a law clinic in this building, but it's not a law clinic to keep you out of jail because you hurt someone or you did something illegal. It's to prevent you from having those problems, like help you with your trademarks, help you with your contracts, help you with your mortgage, make you look at contracts and, and the legal documents that, that 
outline your life along the way really professionally so that you can grow your assets. We'll have a lot of professional development here in partnership with Washington University, um, the Center for Human Services Leadership, because nonprofits don't often have the money to help their executives grow. We're going to grow, we're going to build capacity for these organizations. We have public spaces where you can have board meetings and, you know, bring galas and bring people together for lunch and learns and great speakers will come here all about b helping build you forward, paying it forward, helping you lift up, not, you know, be, keep you in this state of need for the rest of your life. No one wants that. I don't, I don't know why people think they do. They don't, um, but they need a lift up. They don't need a handout. They need a hand up. And I, that's, and all these organizations are designed to do that, but sometimes they don't do it because they're not working with other people. As I said, that rock of education, there's a housing, healthcare, education, a million things under there. And you need to bring those partners together. So one plus one can equal a hundred or a thousand or a million uh, more lives that we can make better. And I think that's as good of, again, teddy bears would do it that way. Wow, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask questions to make sure that all the students that are listening in here today get an idea of who you are, what you've done, what you stand for. But now I want to give the opportunity for all of the audience to ask questions to you. So I encourage everybody, if you have a question, uh, answer, or submit it into the chat, send it to the chat. Um, we will have people that will pick or sort through them, pick one or, or pick a couple and read them out loud. So. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Heinekel, another panelist here, student at University of Missouri. And I'm going to go down the line, pick a few questions. Uh, starting off, I wanted to go with a question from Rachel, which uh, asked, if you were starting uh, Build-A-Bear in 2020 or now, how would you have gone about it? Hmm. Well, I would have gone about it probably the same way. Um, technology would have been a much better state than it was then. Um, but I would have put some, some interesting technology into our store that we actually have now. Uh, but I would have thought differently about our store count. We might not have had as many stores as we have. We eventually got to um, around 350 in the United States and then uh, stores in the UK and around the world. I would have been a little bit more selective. And over a course of time of the 23 years that we've been in business, many of those malls have changed and we haven't necessarily renewed our leases and opened up new stores in different places. But now you can find a Build-A-Bear at Great Wolf Lodge. You can find a Build-A-Bear in a ballpark. You can find Build-A-Bear on a cruise ship. Not this year, but in you know normal times, they would you'd find build a bear in places that you might not expect. Um, so I would have gone about it the same, but I would have also been a little bit, maybe a little bit more discerning about the malls that we went in because I would know more about their future success. Uh, I actually had a follow up question on that. Um, with how much technology is used, how did that impact um, build a bear? Because we know it's it's about the experience about going in and building the bear and putting the heart in and stitching it up. So how has technology and the internet affected that? Uh, hugely, in the very beginning too. Um, when we first start, when I was a little girl, I lost my teddy bear when I was just maybe 10 years old and I've been looking for it ever since. And so one of the things, and my next door neighbor, Katie, who inspired me when she was 10 years old to actually start Build-A-Bear, um, she almost lost her bear, George, on a, a, a a rental van at the airport in Colorado. He just kept going around in circles and finally somebody turned him in. And I didn't want any child to lose their bear. So we created this barcode system. And so maybe you remember when you went to Build-A-Bear and before they stuff your bear, they tear off a piece of the barcode and they put it inside. And then you go to the naming station and you tell us your name and address. And if that bear is ever lost and returned to us, and we've had thousands and thousands of bears, we can open up the bear, scan that barcode and find your address and call you and say, Bryson, we found your bear and, you know, super pup, he was lost and we found him. And then it changed. It's amazing what happens. And so that system was a technology, a basic technology. It was when RFID was being started, but we couldn't afford that. So the guy that was working with us from our technology company about our POS system, he showed me this idea that he thought would work and boom, it worked. And we have, you know, hundreds of, well, 200 million names are registered in our system. Uh, now the privacy laws are a little different. We never did anything wrong with those names, but not everybody gives us their name anymore and their address. They give us their name, but they don't tell us their address. Um, but we also used to use that. So you'd put your birthday in there and we would send you a birthday card and we would send Super Pop a birthday card. 
and Super Pup could come in and get a, a free gift from Build a Bear. So that technology, we didn't have credit our own credit cards. We created a connection with our customers through something that mattered to them, not losing their animal and their birthday and their animal's birthday. And some people have 30, 40, 50 animals. They all got a birthday card from Build a Bear. We didn't put any limit on how many animals you could have or how many birthdays you could celebrate. That's great to hear. Thank you. Hi, Maxine. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm also from the University of Missouri, and I have another question for you from Lloyd. It says, when growing and expanding quickly, what's important to know in order to maintain slash capitalize on that success and traction without losing the moment, momentum that comes along with that? Yeah, um, that's a great qu question because it's, it's the most fun is in the beginning. When you're working the hardest, when you're 24-7, your own business, answering every customer call, you know, writing every letter yourself. But, but you have to bring your employees with you along the, the journey. And if they're always advised of what's going on, we always did that. Every Monday at Build-A-Bear, for the, probably the first 12 years we were open, every Monday we had uh, a welcome for every new person because we oh, we were growing so fast, we we're bringing new people in. And we would have a welcome. We'd sit on the floor and ask a silly question and get to know each other. And that really is a humbling experience. Plus, I love being in the stores. I traveled to every single store opening. Um, I went to, um, when it was somebody's birthday, I communicated with them. I, I still do it. I mean, our employees are still connected to me in a lot of ways. And, and that is, was very meaningful to me personally, because I felt like my company that I work for, the May department stores, treated me that way also. They, they valued my employment and my work, hard work, and they rewarded me accordingly with promotions and better pay. And I wanted to do the same. And my my dream was for all of my employees, I mean this sincerely, to come to me and say, thank you for this success. I'm going to retire and buy a boat and go on Lake of the Ozarks and live the rest of my life. Or I'm going to start my own business. Or I'm going to send my, my children went to college because of the money that we um, made out of Build-A-Bear and Build-A-Bear stock. That's joy. That's what, that's what success is. And that's why you create a business, not for your own personal success, although maybe some people do. It really is for the, the, the jobs and the people's success that work with you. And staying connected to them is the most joyful work you can do. Um, and I say this, I mean this. I mean, I, I, now the children of our employees are, are working at Build-A-Bear or coming to Build-A-Bear or have gone to college because of Build-A-Bear. And there's, that's, that's just incredible opportunity. And that's what all business owners, regardless of what business you go into, that you should think and hope for your employees um, and the people that you work with is bringing them along with you on the ride to success, it's much more fun when you have people with you. And again, that's, in my opinion, my, my greatest advisor was my teddy bear that I lost when I was 10 years old. And I wonder what he would think. And he would tell me to do that. And if you think of things in that perspective, always the golden rule, at Build-A-Bear, the golden rule is give honey unto others as you would have honey given to you because bears <laughs> like honey. But we had our own language also, our own culture that we built around the love of a teddy bear. Uh, and uh, it never led us astray. Ever. Thank you. I'm a firm believer uh, in setting a positive company culture. So thank you for that. You're welcome. All right. We have a question from Logan and he asked, what was the hardest part uh, about getting the first Build-A-Bear workshop open for business? Hmm. The hardest part was, was delivering it all on budget because we'd never done it before. It was our first store. It was a prototype. And I wanted it to be Willy Wonka chocolate factory, you know, kind of experience. So everything was bigger than life. And, and most of those elements aren't in a Build-A-Bear store anymore because they were so expensive. And they took up valuable space for, you know, children. We had many more customers than I ever thought we would have. So we had to make room for them. But it was getting it open on budget. It was, it was a, probably about 25% over budget. And, um, and I wanted it to be open on time. So we had to work overtime to get it done that quickly. Because from the day I had the idea when I was out with my friend Katie and her little brother Jack looking for a beanie baby to the time we opened was only nine months. That's pretty fast. Um, and so um, we had to negotiate the lease, design the store, you know, build it. And we, everybody was new. Nobody, there were, no, was no Build-A-Bear before. So even our designer who lived in Arizona, um, he, had, he had to use the designs of my brand designer and we, who knew? We didn't even know what material to make it out of. We all started from scratch, but we did a great job, obviously. And um, their knowledge, each of them and their own expertise helped me be successful. And then our landlord, who, the person that owned the mall, he wanted us to be successful. He gave us this location, dead center in the mall. He wanted it to be like the flagship store. It's still there, by the way, all these years later. 
Uh, and it looks like a new store, even though it's not a new store. No. I think an important part that you just mentioned is your team around you and how everybody brought their own expertise and knowledge and was able to help and support Build-A-Bear. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about kind of your philosophy for choosing who you work with and who you bring in um, and who you recruit into Build-A-Bear. Yeah, you know, like a lot of retail stores, you probably know this as shoppers, you go into the store and they kind of look like you, they're young people, they're very fit, they can wear the clothes. We didn't have to worry about that. We just wanted to hire people that were huggable or that aren't related to kids, you know, that would want to. So I thought that I could hire um, uh, teachers and nurses and all these people that engage with children. And I also wanted to bring people back from welfare to work. So I was willing to take a risk on people. And the, the challenge was that all worked in some cases it did, in some cases it didn't, but it was a much bigger volume store than we anticipated. And so now the store person who might've been a teacher, not a business person had to manage the, the schedule for 35 employees that were working in that store. And they never had done a schedule like that before. So we had to learn alongside of each other. And eventually I realized that I had to hire experienced retail people I, to run the place, but I could hire teachers and social workers and bring some other people underneath them um, to support and learn along the way. Um, so most of those things worked, but they didn't work the first time. They eventually worked, but I had to go through a few tries to make it work. But everybody wanted it to be so successful. One of my greatest workers was a school teacher. He worked part-time and he was the one that actually had the idea about putting the heart in the bear with a wish. I had the hearts there that came from another friend of mine, but he turned it into a ceremony because he was a very exciting teacher. He loved his kids and he really taught a lot about but with enthusiasm. And so he put that enthusiasm into our um, heart ceremony that I would not have thought of, you know? So it was all everybody coming together. So teachers added value, a nurse added another value. Another person was a, a, an art teacher. She brought in a ton of ideas and we were able to you know, grow the company along that way with um, everybody participating and, and knowing that they participated. Um, it was really, a, and we made mistakes. I call it the red pencil award because my teacher that, um, when we made a mistake, we turned it lemons into lemonade. Um, and there's many of those stories, um, you know, uh, that we did. We just wanted to, uh, anybody know how to fix this? And they fixed it and we found it a better way. Uh, and that's how, another real way that the company grew. So everybody had a vested interest in our success, in, including our customers who had sent us many ideas. Children always had an idea for me when they met me of a new animal we could make, a new color, a new outfit, a new band we could mimic, uh, just amazing things. Um, that they told us. They always felt comfortable telling us because we were their store. We were a place they could be comfortable. And if you think about it from another standpoint, when you go to buy a car, how could they make it, everyone who walks in there feel like they're going to buy the, their, their dream car, whether it's a, a Ford or it's a Mercedes, it doesn't matter, but make everybody feel that way. They don't do that, but they could. And then you'd be a customer for life. Uh, and I think our customers are now bringing their own children. You know, they've grown up and they're having their own children and they're bringing the next generation uh, to Build-A-Bear. And that's the greatest honor you can have is when, the ch when somebody wants you to have that Disney-esque experience, but it's at our store, not at Disneyland or Disney World. They can go there too, but we're right around the corner. We're much easier to access. Thank you. All right, Maxine, I have another question for you from Lauren. Where do you see companies like Build-A-Bear that provide that in-person mall experience that you were just talking about, like the magical in-person feel? Where do you think that's going to go after post-COVID? Uh, well, I've, I've actually surprised that prior to COVID, more companies hadn't thought about creating an experience, the Build-A-Bear experience. Usually what happens in, in any kind of trend is people, you know, go and mimic it in some way, shape, or form. Not in... in um, uh, the same exact way, but they apply it to their business. But uh, there's been so many business developments in the last 25 years, like Starbucks and uh, Amazon and other people have created their own experience, their own personal touch on the business that's made us want to go there. You know, Howard Schultz didn't invent coffee. Ray Kroc didn't invent hamburgers. I didn't invent teddy bears. But we invented a better way. And they all have their own experience. I'm on the board of Foot Locker. Foot Locker is, um, you know, a store that most people love. When I go to college campuses, they're almost as excited about Foot Locker as they are about Build-A-Bear. Uh, and because Foot Locker creates an experience that you can go in there and buy your shoes and, and come out feeling like, you know, they were worth it. Um, and I, I think that's what you want to feel when you spend your money with somebody is that they made you feel special. They made you feel like it was worth it. 
and they'll come back. And experience varies. You know, when you check into a hotel or you an airplane or, you know, an airport or a cruise ship or it doesn't have to be as experiential as those. But but why not? I mean, why not create something that people are going to remember? What is hard about that? I, I think it's easy, actually. And I always say to people, call me. I'll, we'll brainstorm. We can come up with about five ideas in less than 10 minutes that you could turn, it w- would experience experienceify, I want to make up a word, uh, your business that would make it better than it was the day before. Not because it's my idea, but because I look at it through the eyes of a customer. And if you ask your customers, they're writing you letters, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, commenting on businesses every single day. What? It's free. They're giving you free feedback. And you learn as much from the negative comments, maybe more than you do the, from the positive comments. Because you, and you don't, you don't want to be defensive about it. Oh my gosh, that might've really happened. I've got to go check it out. There's a lot to be learned in, in, in those um, negative comments about improving your business. But sometimes some customer service person is reading those, not the CEO of the company. And that's a mistake. That's a mistake. I mean, I used to read every single letter. I still get letters from customers. But I would say that you should at least review some of them every single day. Tell the customer service to bring you the worst and the best. And then put them together and see what you find out about your business from that experience. And you can turn it into something much different and much more meaningful for the customer. Well, thank you. I think experiences are what people truly remember um, when they go to build a bear and when they just shop in general, it's about, as you said, the experience. How did somebody make you feel? If they made you feel like a million bucks and you spent a dollar, that's a pretty darn good thing. Yeah. I agree. Going back to the overarching theme of like social entrepreneurship, I thought, uh, Charlie had a really cool question. He says, uh, you call yourself a uh, quote unquote, uh, retired entrepreneur. Uh, what invite, uh, what events occurred to help you decide to like, move your main focus away from build a bear to your other social entrepreneurship, uh, like themes and like your philanthropy and, uh, Del Mar divine. Great question. Well, I started build a bear. I told you I was 48 years old. So you can figure out my age. And I knew that I had X amount of time on this planet, maybe up till year a hundred. Um, And I had X amount of time to do the things I wanted to do. And so uh, the best thing that a founder can do for their company, besides creating the company, is making sure that you find a successor to carry on after you, to make it better um, than you could have made it. Um, Nobody could have invented Build-A-Bear like I did, but somebody could take it to a new future. And that was very important. So that was a strategic decision. I thought it would actually happen earlier, but the recession came along and I didn't want to leave while the business was on a downturn. I wanted to leave when it was on an upswing. So that took a little few more years than I anticipated. Uh, but I knew that there were things that could do. And I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm, I'm retired from Build-A-Bear, but I'm not retired from um, being an entrepreneur. And in fact, I work with my you know I, entrepreneurs all across the country and have a great time living through their living vicariously through their successes and learning from their their things that they're failing at if they're failing right now they're not they're you know the biggest problem they have is meeting the inventory demands because the world is um, all shook up uh, you know ports are closed boats are taking longer than usual factories are you know having to replace their people but it wasn't any different really I mean you know doing something like this is a merchandising this building that we're, that's behind me I'm mer- I, finding the tenants was merchandising. It was like, like merchandising a mall or merchandising a store, putting the right tenants together so that we can be more successful for St. Louis. It's no different. It's really the same skills. Um, but not everybody can see themselves in those different worlds. I, I could, you know, I, I was doing a lot of those things for Build-A-Bear. So, um, but I could see myself, I had a plan and this was just part of the plan. And, uh, Thank goodness I've been able to do all these good things and there's more to come that we're working on. Thank you. You've shared so much advice and you've shared your experiences with us. Uh, I hope everybody else was taking notes. But the last question that I want to ask you is what is one more piece of advice that you want to give us as students, as college students Mm -hmm. um, going through our journeys? I know this is a hard one, but I would write a plan. I would put it in writing. Because the first person you have to convince that being an entrepreneur, social or for-profit is yourself. And when you write that plan and you put all of your best ideas into it, it doesn't mean you have to do them in day one or day two or day 10. But 
you'll, if you put everything into it, you'll be able to convince yourself it's worth doing. And then in turn, you'll be able to convince others, banks, friends, customers, that what you're doing is important. And I know it's hard to do that, to commit to writing. Most people show me a PowerPoint presentation, not a business plan. I would say that show me the long plan. I want to read it. I want to hear your story. I want you to tell me why you want to do this. And then we'll get it down to the nuts and bolts. But first, write a business plan. And mine was 10 years. I had a 10-year plan, including that our 100th store would be at Roosevelt Mall, um, which is the, um, in the year of the 100th anniversary of the teddy bear. And Teddy Roosevelt sort of gave the name to the teddy bear. So we lived out our, our plan. But, um, but it was pretty exacting. Uh, but, it was, but there were a lot of things that happened a year early or a year late or two years late. It's okay. You know, you just adjust the plan and, you know, you, you do it online. So you can, it's a constantly work in progress. That's what a plan is. It's a work in progress. It's not the absolute way that you have to do it. It's the guideline to get you to where you want to go. And I think that that's an important um, strategy for yourself. Um, and then you'll convince the banker, the investors, the customers uh, to come along with you for the ride. Wow. Thank you. Is there any... Um, anything else that you would want to share with us? Any story or anything else with these final minutes left? Uh, no, I think I kind of told you all the story, but I would say you're never too old for a teddy bear. I don't <laughs> care. Uh, anybody. I mean, really and truly, we all need somebody we can hug, especially in this last year. And so um, I think that, you know, just don't ever say, oh, I'm not going to that store. I'm too Not because I'm trying to do the business, but because you need a hug. And a stuffed animal can, you know, you can kind of just quietly talk to super pup, right? And give <laughs> super pup that, and give super pup a hug for me. Nice. Will do, will do. Uh, can't wait to go back and see super pup again. Thanks, uh, Bryson. <laughs> yes. So that seems to be um, all the time we have left for questions. Um, it went by really fast and it was amazing to talk to you. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. I know you have a busy schedule, so it means a lot and we truly, truly, truly appreciate it. Um, and while we're thanking you just for being here and speaking to us, let's not forget all the amazing things um, that you've done and that you're doing for St. Louis and just worldwide. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It was really fun. You're a great interviewer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And then I believe there should be a slideshow coming up here one second with some more information. Um, so if you're feeling inspired by Maxine's work or her perspective on social entrepreneurship and how businesses can make change, or even if you have a business idea and you're not quite sure um, where to start or how to get funding, or even if you already have a business, I suggest you check out For Impact. It's here um, on the screen.